Hello and welcome to the day two of MD and DI's Focus on Fundamentals course, Medical Device and Pharmaceutical Testing, Regulatory Updates, Trends and Anticipated Changes, including FDA, ISO, USP, and MDRs, sponsored by Nelson Laboratories. I'm Chris Keach and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn more about today's speakers, download resources, share this, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. Please note that during our Q&A session today, we will try to get to as many questions as we can, but if we're not able to get to your question today, someone will be getting back to you via email. Also, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and you may download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the, towards the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click on the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to today's class. Package Testing and Sterilization Methodologies, Updates, Trends, and Anticipated Changes. Discussing today's topic from Nelson Laboratories is Wendy Mock, Packaging uh, Selection Leader, Jason Pope, Senior Scientist, Martel Winters, Senior Scientist, and Paul Litley, Consulting Manager. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the BIOS widget. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Wendy to begin. Wendy? Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to get started with um, the package integrity testing. My agenda today is going to focus on two items. I'm going to be talking about progressing from the medical device directive to the medical device regulations. There's been some changes in that arena. And then I'm going to touch on USP Chapter 1207 with mass and some mass extraction leak technologies. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the medical device regulations, or the MDRs. It has been well established at this point that Europe's medical device regulations are about to change. But what are these changes and why were they made? The MDDs were primarily designed to provide a path using essential requirements that allow users to demonstrate compliance with health and safety requirements. The end result after compliance was the ability to CE mark your product and legally distribute in the EU. The newly focused MDRs, while continuing to provide regulation requirements through compliance with the ERs, also incorporate the development of innovation for future technologies. The change is that the MDRs will now cover devices that previously fell under two separate European directives, the Medical Device Directive and the Active Implantable Medical Device Directive, AIMDD. In vitro diagnostic devices will be covered in the new IVDR, which will be coming later. Working towards success, um, with these changes in the MDRs, we are focusing on a couple of committees that are hoping to create success. Currently in the U.S., the FDA accepts ISO 11607 as the consensus standard for sterile packaging to demonstrate compliance to the regulations. This document currently, however, is lacking the same acceptance level that the MDRs will strive for. The AMI Working Group has been proactively trying to update the EN ISO document over the last year to ensure that the new revision will bring alignment with the MDRs, thwarting the need for the development of common specifications that will be developed if incomplete areas within the standard method continue to exist. A breakdown of the MDRs. The MDDs free previously focused on the initial qualification of a device and its packaging. This has evolved to more representative of a life cycle approach that is similar to how the US FDA approaches reviews. The MDRs provide explicit directions for documenting and performing packaging validations for the sterile medical packaging. However, 
if previous validation work has been completed, performing new or additional testing may not necessarily be needed, assuming the original validation work will meet the requirements outlined in the MDRs and can be justified. Regarding the sterile barrier system, companies with low-risk devices that have previously relied on past experience to meet these requirements when being evaluated by notified bodies will now need to provide objective evidence on their SBSs. If this data doesn't exist, testing will need to be performed to bring their products into compliance. With respect to distribution cycles, Annex 1 states that devices shall be designed, manufactured, and packaged in such a way that their characteristics and performance are not adversely affected during transport and storage. Frequently, manufacturers will just purchase a pouch or packaging material off the shelf without any consideration to the design. A lot of times we will see them where they're too big or they're too small, and it usually ends up having failures. So when evaluating the SBS in the distribution environment, failures frequently detected are due to this incompatibility of size or materials. Those manufacturers will now be faced with justifying the suitability of these materials and formally docu documenting the applicability through controlled testing. Validation work also has some changes. Manufacturers should be aware that there is a requirement to demonstrate state of the art. And what this is, is the expectation to monitor your competitors' products and packaging and ensure that the current offerings are not suddenly outdated by the introduction of new technologies that would improve the safety of your device or reduce its risks in the market. Compliance is also demonstrated through documentation and justification that the current packaging design is suitable and no modern packaging type of material that would improve your safety currently exists. Important dates. One of the most important dates right now is that the MD regulations were formally published in the official journal on the 26th of May, 2017. There is a transitional period that allows full implementation by the 26th of May, 2020, although there will be the expectation that people are working towards this before then. The ISO document that is currently in process of being revised is planned for publication in the fall of 2019, assuming that no technical issues need to be resolved. Uh, this is possible, but very rare, and um, due to the significant amount of work and effort that's been put in by the group to ensure alignment, it is not expected. I'm going to start talking about USP Chapter 1207 now. Um, that was just a brief summary of some of the things that were happening with the MDRs. Um, chapter 1207 was recently issued, and it was a rewrite of the original chapter. The integration of packaging integrity assurance is a key component of the entire product life cycle and is stressed through these three subchapters that provide guidance on the selection, validation, and use of leak technologies in addition to a chapter regarding package seal quality tests. One of the key takeaways from this chapter is the establishment of a table that classifies integrity test methods into either a deterministic or a probabilistic method. A deterministic method is being objective or quantitative test results. Um, to quote, these methods are capable of detecting leaks at clearly defined and predictable detection limits. They are reproducible and many of them are non-destructive. Whereas looking at probabilistic methods, which are subjective and qualitative, they are best chosen when the method outcome requires a demand of specific probabilistic approaches. 
for example, a dye immersion or bacterial immersion are examples of these methods. They are mostly non-reproducible and very destructive to the test method, eliminating the possibility of failure investigation after the test is complete. This slide is an example of some of the detection ranges that are listed in the in the chapter um, and uh, the different methods. As part of the table, you can see that each evaluates different detection ranges, but for the most part, the newer technologies that have been developed are very similar in their capabilities. It's just the method is different. As a laboratory that evaluates multiple different types of packaging configurations, the mass extraction leak testing method allows us the most flexibility and compatibility when evaluating multiple modes of packaging for package integrity testing. As a new technology, we feel it paves the way for many pharmaceutical companies that struggle with probabilistic liquid dye immersion methods to move to a more sensitive, repeatable, and non-destructive deterministic method. This method provides the ability to detect holes in a variety of non-porous rigid packages by measuring the amount of air extracted from final package configurations. It can be used on liquid or lyophilized powder vials, auto injectors, syringes, and more product types. Additionally, this is currently a work item in the ASTM methods. Um, it is that final ballot, and we're hoping for a release in the next few months. Here's a list of the pros and cons behind mass extraction leak testing. Mass extraction uses air rather than expensive gases. It is a direct flow measurement of the leak. Um, as I've said before, it's non-destructive. They're designed to be used in both commercial and inline manufacturing, allow you to have independent verification testing of the actual product as it's made. There is a short cycle time and is minimally affected by environmental changes. The cons that we have run into include sometimes it's difficult if uh, vials have labels on them because they harbor air and so it just takes a little bit longer to evacuate the air from behind the labels or you have to remove the labels which can add a little bit of time and then a lot of the uh, methods will need custom tooling or fillers. Uh, mass extraction leak testing, although no one test demonstrates a one-size-fits-all, uh, we have selected the extraction method because it allows us to have the most flexibility while providing a highly sensitive method. If you're interested in additional information regarding mass extraction leak testing, we have an article published in the Packaging Digest container closure integrity testing through mass extraction and you can access it at this website. Um, and now I will pass off the baton to Jason Pope who's going to talk about sterilization methodologies. Thank you, Wendy. We are going to cover some of the industry developments and changes on the ISO and AMI level regarding sterilization. So regarding steam sterilization, uh, the, single, the, the single item to discuss uh, with this slide is the update of the ISO 17665 series. Currently, there is an effort to combine part one with the guidance portions, part two, and possibly part three, uh, combining the normative with the informative in a manner that's similar to the recent work that was done with ISO 11.35, 11.36, 11.37, 11.38, 11.39, 
the ethylene oxide document. Uh, the AMI task group has completed edits that have been forwarded to the ISO folks for consideration that provides additional guidance for biological cycle validation, including overkill method, combined BI bioburden method, strict bioburden method. And this working group will be meeting in October 2017 at the AMI meetings, and there will be more to come. Okay, regarding biological indicators, the ISO 11138 series, uh, there's been quite a bit of activity. Um, documents are being numbered. Um, one of those documents that you should be aware of is that ISO 14161 will now be 11138-7. That document is for sterilization of healthcare products, biological indicators, guidance for the selection, use, and interpretation of results. Um, another noteworthy item uh, is in reference to ISO 11138-5, which is sterilization of healthcare products, biological indicators, biological indicators for low temperature steam and formaldehyde sterilization processes. The FDA abstained from voting because they do not recognize this document. Now, um, there is a new development regarding hydrogen peroxide sterilization and the BIs that are used for that sterilization modality, ISO 11138-6. Uh, there are questions regarding how to approach the D-value testing, and uh, we'll get into that with our next slide. The question is, how do we standardize the D-value testing for BIs that are used for vaporized hydrogen peroxide processes. Do we use a liquid method using a solution of liquid H2O2, or do we do that testing with vaporized hydrogen peroxide? There is some disagreement on the parameters that would be used for D-value testing with BHP. Um, and that has, there, there are folks that are divided on how to approach this question. Um, liquid hydrogen peroxide devalue testing does not reflect BI usage in uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization processes, but it, it does at least give a benchmark. So some folks are in favor of accepting that current proposed method. Others would like to see the document reflect real-world usage in a vaporized hydrogen peroxide process. And there will be more to come at the fall 2017 AMI working group meeting. I'll now pass over to Martel Winters to talk about some developments at the AMI and ISO level. Thank you, Jason. So we have some interesting things going on with regards to sterility assurance uh, or assurance of sterility, as as uh, the the uh, some other documents call it. So I want to touch first on a a new technical specification from ISO, which is 19930, and. I did not put the title on the slide, but uh, it's a long title, but I just want to focus a little bit uh, the, the, a couple of key points in the title. First of all, that it's a risk-based approach uh, regarding assurance of sterility. And it's also uh, specifically the focus on healthcare products that are unable to withstand a typical 10 to the minus 6 sterilization process. Now, this document was meant to be a very forward-thinking document. Currently, there are not a large number of healthcare products 
that there there are some, but there is not a large number of products that that have this problem where it need it does need to be terminally sterilized, but none of the current sterilization methods can be applied in a way to to easily achieve a 10 to the minus 6 stability assurance level. But we know of some types of products that, that have that problem, but we wanted to be forward thinking so that so we could open the door for these very innovative uh, combination type products where a, a typical process will be very difficult, uh, the typical sterilization process. A couple of main points of this document, uh, it, if it, I, I, I'm not sure exactly when it should be coming out, but we should have it uh, later this year. Uh, it was approved a few months ago, and so we should be able to see it. The, a couple of main things. So it does have, I believe, nine strategies that you can employ to obtain a 10 to the minus 6 sterilization process. And those strategies provide a lot of detail. I was very pleased with the end result here that for someone who who is used to sterilizing in a particular way and it's proving challenging for their product that they can go to this ISO this ISO technical specification and get some good uh, a good tutorial on different things that that they can try to uh, to obtain a 10 to the minus 6 sterilization process. Now, hand in hand with that, we have a U.S. document, which is ST67. Now, this standard has been around as as a as a U.S. standard for many years, and it has for a long time provided good guidance on how to uh, on what is important with regards to stability assurance levels and options on how to justify use of an alter of alternate stability assurance level, for example, 10 to the minus 3, 4, or 5, where 10 to the minus 6 is not possible. There's a term that we, that we uh, have been using, which is reasonably practicable, which takes some practice to be able to say, but the point there is it is not expected that companies uh, exhaust resources and years of time to find a way to be able to achieve 10 to, achieve 10 to the minus 6 but that it is, it is expected that some reasonable amount of work go into trying to obtain that. If that's not possible, uh, and with a reasonable amount of, of work, then there are options on, on rationalizing an, an alternate SAL, for example, 10 to the minus 3, 4, or 5. Now, SD67 gives some good examples, and we're in the process of revising that standard right now where we've added additional examples. It gives a great history on uh, assurance of sterility, and uh, that document is the one that we point to in the U.S. to say that 10 to the minus 3 is perfectly acceptable for some products based on their intended use, and there is no requirement that that the, the label be any different. Uh, you, you still say sterile, whether it's 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 6, and you just have it rationalized uh, on, on your internal paperwork. But if it, the main differentiator being whether the product comes into contact with compromised tissue or not. So for compromised tissue, it is expected 10 to the minus 6. If it's not, then 10 to the minus 3 is, is generally acceptable. And that's all outlined in ST67. Okay, the, the bottom note there, sterilization versus aseptic processing. One thing that we try to do in both of these documents is to make it clear that values such as 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus anything are not appropriate for use with aseptic processing. A, a sterility assurance level inherent in that, in that title, a sterility assurance level, is the concept that, that a sterilization process is being applied. If you are maintaining sterility, such as in an aseptic process, there is no value applied to that with regards to sterility assurance. <clears throat> so, the, with regards to the bioburden standard, <clears throat> there are some, some, some significant changes that we are that we are making to some of these documents. 
uh, and first, the first one mentioned there is TS22456. So this is a, a an ISO technical specification on microbiological testing, specifically bioburden and sterility with regards to tissue and tissue-based products. There are some unique challenges that come into play when performing microbiology tests on those types of products, and these uh, this this technical specification is intended to, to help provide some guidance on that testing. The next one, the FDIS of 11737-1, actually a day or two ago we received a final 15-day review uh, for the final draft standard of the BioBurden document, which is the 11737-1. I just want to touch on a few things that are, that are going to be uh, new or different in that, in that new revision. Uh, the biggest thing is probably that we are taking out the comment in the annex that refers to a recovery efficiency of greater than 50% being desirable. That value of 50% was always arbitrary. There were no uh, data behind that. And as a result, we're not a, a fan of having something which has been perceived to be a requirement in an annex where there are no data to back it up. So the focus now, rather than on a on an arbitrary value, the focus now is where it should be, which is on are the if you have a, a series of data, are the data consistent? And is the value reasonable for the intent for which the, the, the number is being used? So it's not it's not as easy because we don't just provide a value but it's a much better scientific approach in that you are given the opportunity to review the data and determine if it is acceptable for your use. We uh, added some, some more discussion on less than values and limits of detection, which I think will be useful to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples when we are looking at bioburden data from different companies. We're putting a little more emphasis on an inhibition test for bioburden testing as part of the validation process. So this is a is very similar to the traditional bacterial stasis fungistasis test or method suitability test for sterility. Just want to make sure that in the bioburden test we're not seeing any inhibition in that test system. We're uh, providing some flexibility on recovery efficiency in there. There are a few places where we talk about that recovery efficiency testing and other types of tests that are, that are normally have previously been seen as required in all instances where if you have a good rationale that it is reasonable to not have to perform that on every single product type or size that you might that you might uh, be manufacturing. There is uh, some additional information on testing of product with very low bio burden because we see that being a challenge sometimes. There's uh, we put in a table of uh, when a, a uh, repetitive recovery recovery efficiency test might be more appropriate and when an inoculated recovery efficiency approach might be more appropriate, which we think will be useful. And then we also added a table on typical assignment of responsibilities just to make it clear generally where the responsibility lies with different aspects of a bioburden test. Does it lie more on the manufacturer or more on the laboratory, the contract laboratory? Okay, and then just the last bullet point there, the 1177-2, so that's the ISO facility document. We are just beginning a review of that document, so I do not quite know what to anticipate regarding changes there, uh, big changes. I do not anticipate any big changes at this point. Uh, that's a fairly robust document, and uh, but we are just starting that review, and so we, uh, in a couple of years, we'll have a new a new revision of that standard as well. Next slide, uh, we do have a new, uh, those of you that are familiar with the VDMAX approach to, radi to validating and maintaining a radiation uh, sterilization dose, it's, uh, we have a new document here, TIR-76. So with regards to VDMAX, we were frequently getting requests for, well, you know, what if I want a VDMAX dose uh, for 18 and a half kilograys? You know, there's no table in the standard for determining an, a, you know, an, an approach to validating these other VDMAX doses. And also an alternate SAL. If I 
if I have a uh, if I have a, a pad that I need to that I want to have is sterile, but it's not going inside the body or co or contacting compromised tissue, how do I do that with VD Max? And right up until now, there was no option but to go with method one, which for those of you that are familiar with that requires a significant amount, a sig significantly greater amount of of uh, sterility testing. So this new standard, uh, this new document from Amy. I will actually have a spreadsheet. It is the first time that Amy is incorporating a spreadsheet, a functional spreadsheet, as part of their their product offering. The spreadsheet in this spreadsheet, you will enter the appropriate data, and it will give you. Uh, you can choose any SAL for the product. You can choose any uh, any sterilization dose, and you can enter in your bioburden counts and it will give you the, the appropriate verification dose, or it will tell you that it is not appropriate at the sterilization dose you've selected because the bio burden is too high. So uh, we're just starting that, but it should be a fairly quick turnaround on that one because it's, it's exactly like any other VDMAX document. We're just, uh, uh, just applying a spreadsheet rather than tables in the, in the document. So TIR40, we're just in the process of, re of revising that one. Those of you that are familiar with method two, uh, this is a modified method two that allows you to reduce the quantity of samples that are being tested. Again, we do not anticipate any big changes in this document, uh, like the Strulity document, but, uh, but we, it is under revision uh, and should be out in about a year. And then the ISO 11137 series. So of that series, the dash two has fairly recently been updated. The dash one, uh, the, the radiation sterilization requirements, although it does contain, uh, although it does carry a, uh, a, a more recent year, that was a, a very limited review of information in there. And there is quite a bit of information that needs to be updated in that. So that will be a fairly substantial update as we go through the 11137-1 document. I do not have any updates yet, uh, anything specific as far as changes there. Um, because it's still early in that process, but th but there will be some significant changes to that to that standard. Okay, and the last slide before I hand it back to Jason is the on sterilization terminology. So, those of you familiar with this document, it's 11139. Uh, it, it it is a very useful document in that it uh, the previous version combined all of the the terms and definitions from all the standards. And the, previous, the, the current version that we have in place is a fairly small document. This next version will be much larger. The scope uh, previously was generally, if it's, a, if it's a term that is used in multiple standards, then we'll put it in here. The approach now is more uh, trying to encompass most or all terms and definitions. In the in the ISO standard, so it is a it is a much larger standard now, uh, with a much larger list of of terms. It's going through, I believe, its third review right now, the the current document. So um, it, it will affect how working groups uh, define terms. Um, either they will have to use the term in their standard from the terminology standard, the 11139. Uh, or what many of them are doing, if, if it's not a term that is used frequently, if it's only used a couple of times in the standard, uh, we will be more likely defining the term when it is used rather than having a definition at the beginning. And that is all I have. I'll turn the time back over to Jason Pope. Thank you, Martel. One exciting development um, on the ISO and AMI level is the creation of a new document to guide vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization. Currently, an ISO convener has been assigned to this uh, effort, and uh, assuming that um, ISO formally approves the creation of this document, which is expected, Amy will form a new working group. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about 
um, sterilization and the MDRs, some of the highlights of the MDRs with regard to sterilization. Um, one thing that uh, needs to be pointed out is that the MDRs detail expectations of reviewers. The document emphasizes that reviewers need to be knowledgeable in the areas they review. Also, the MDRs reiterate importance of ensuring sterility until the sterile packaging is opened or damaged. The document emphasizes that production of a sterile product requires more than just successful sterilization. The entire production process should be develop, developed and engineered to ensure that sterility is maintained until the product is used. Uh, packaging should be able to maintain sterility and to avoid damage. And it also uh, covers the idea that shelf life is, an is event related. A sterilized product will continue to maintain sterility until an event occurs that compromises sterility. It is not a time-based concept. Instead, it is an event-related concept. Another item that's pointed out in the MDRs relates to reusable devices. Information needs to be provided to the end user to allow them to determine when a device has reached its end of life. Um, for example, signs of material degradation of the maximum allowable reuses. Um, this might also be an, an, it might be an inspectable condition. It might also be a total number of allowed reprocessing cycles. And it should be mentioned that this is already a focus of the US FDA. So this is something that, for many of you, may not be a new concept. Another thing that's pointed out in the MDRs relates to environmental considerations. A description of the environmental conditions for the relevant manufacturing steps should be in place. Information should be provided relating to the environment in which a product is made. And for sterile products, the methods used for environmental control prior to sterilization, controls for incoming supplies, in-process screening and product screening prior to sterilization, sterilization validation documentation, and packaging testing and appropriate and a description of the appropriateness for maintaining sterility. Uh, the focus, to summarize, the focus is really about looking at your product from its developmental stages till that point where it is actually used. In other words, a cradle to grave approach. One of the biggest changes uh, that uh, is, is, is in the MDRs relates to uh, classification around orthope the orthopedic space, mainly due to concerns around their long-term performance. Under a previous amendment to the MDD, all hip, knee, and shoulder joint replacements were reclassified from class 2B to class 3. Uh, we will be discussing this uh, portion of the MDRs in more detail uh, on day three of this webinar, so stay tuned for that discussion. Now, one trend that uh, we want to cover relates to the reporting of the sterility assurance level. When reporting sterility assurance level, to align with the AMI definitions and the ISO definitions, the SAL is reported as 10 to a negative exponent. The larger that ex the, the larger X is in our slide, the smaller the SAL and the greater assurance of sterility it provides. In other words, 
10 to the minus 7 is smaller than 10 to the minus 6 and provides a greater assurance of sterility. When and, uh, Another example would be in a situation where we have validated an overkill half cycle method and our BI population is greater than or equal to 1.0 times 10 to the 6 CFU and we kill all of our BIs in that half cycle. The SAL for the full cycle is correctly reported as less than or equal to 10 to the minus 6, not greater than or equal to 10 to the minus 6. Nelson Laboratories still receives requests to report as greater than or equal to 10 to the minus 6 in these situations. Uh, this is not correct as defined by ANSI, AMI, and ISO. These requests, we see the, them come from medical device companies and regulatory reviewers. Okay, at, at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to Paul Litley to discuss ethylene oxide sterilization. Thank you, Jason. In this next session for sterilization, we'll look at the current status and upcoming changes in industrial ethylene oxide sterilization. As discussed earlier in this presentation, the NBR has not identified additional requirements specific to the sterilization modalities. For this reason, we will focus primarily on changes and updates to ISO 11135 and the associated AAMI technical information reports. As of this September 11135-2014 has reached its three-year phase-in period, meaning that the manufacturer should now be compliant with the 2014 version in its entirety. The timeline leading up to this phase and period occurred as the ISO committee publishing the 2014 version of the document in September of 2014. Shortly thereafter, the US FDA accepted the, doc the document as a consensus standard. The AAMI committee accepted the document in September of 2015 without exclusions. Despite the one year period between ISO publication and AAMI acceptance, the version remains as a 2014 revision and the phase-in period started with the initial ISO publication. Currently, the ISO and AMI committees are updating and revising Annex E single lot release. Additional guidance is being added for best practice, including criteria for testing approach in the event the manufacturer would be using data from the batch release pr process to support future sterilization validations. Furthermore, recommendations for limiting or discouraging the use of single lot batch release as a mode of routine sterilization uh, for productions are being added as well. Although the committee agrees that the approach to single lot batch release is scientifically valid, the intent of the annex was for the allowance of sterilization of small lots or clinical batches and not take the place of a validated sterilization process. Since the inception of 2014, the 2014 revision, the AAMI committee has been diligently reviewing and updating the associated technical information reports for EO sterilization. PIRs listed on this slide have been updated and published in 2016. AAMI TIR 14, which is the contract sterilization using ethylene oxide, provides a guidance that augments 11135 both for medical device manufacturers that use contract sterilization facilities and for contract sterilization operations. The TIR addresses how 11135 applies to contract sterilization operations for, device market, for devices marketed in the United States. It should be noted that EO contract sterilization guidance is for, is for healthcare providers is not specifically covered in this TIR. The next TIR, TIR 15, Physical Aspects of Ethylene Oxide Sterilization, provides guidance on sterilization equipment considerations for preconditioning and how to calculate re relative humidity, EO concentrations, and flammability, as well as provides a guidance on the use of statistics for process equivalence. TIR 28, Product Adoption and Process Equivalence for Ethylene Oxide Sterilization, provides a guidance for when a new product is being added to, the previous, to a previously validated process or when changes to, a valid, to validated products are being evaluated. Also, a pre, uh, 
when a previously validated process is being moved to a different facility or to a different piece of equipment, and when equivalence of sterilization process is being evaluated. The last TIR in this list, TIR 74, is a change summary for the ISO 11135-2014 version. This document provides a summary of the differences between the new 2014 version and the old 2007 version of the standard. The intent was to provide the end user a quick reference when evaluating and implementing the 2014 version of ISO 11135 in the facilities. This document is pivotal in identifying and assessing potential gaps in the manufacturer's process. Currently, the AAMI committee is in progress of reviewing and updating TIR 16, Microbiological Aspects of EO Sterilization. The document addresses various microbiological aspects for the development and validation of an EO sterilization process and provides additional guidance for 11135. The document is in its, is in its final committee review with three, only three remaining open comments which will be addressed during this fall's uh, AAMI meeting, October 2000, uh, 2017. Once this TIR is updated and published, it will replace the current 2009 ver revision, which was reaffirmed in 2013. The new TIR version is expected to be published in early 2018. I now turn the presentation back over to Chris. All right, thank you, Paul, Martel, Jason, and Wendy for a fantastic presentation. Now, before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available on the right-hand side of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking on the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if we're not able to get to your particular question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers who can reply to you offline after the webinar is over. So let's move on now with our first question. Looks like our first question, I'm going to throw it out to all of you. Uh, how common is vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization in-house at healthcare systems? Hi, Chris. This is Jason, and I'll take that question. Uh, we are seeing that vaporized hydrogen peroxide systems are becoming much more common in healthcare uh, settings. There is a need for sterilization other than steam sterilization for devices that cannot handle the uh, high temperatures associated with sterilization. It is becoming more common, uh, and it, uh, it is something that many healthcare facilities have access to. I'll turn it back to you, Chris. All right, thank you, Jason. Our next question is going to be specifically, I guess, for Martel. You're a popular guy. So, Martel, can you provide examples uh, on when it would be acceptable uh, not to perform recovery efficiency and how it may be justified? Sure, I can provide that. So, we had some very specific discussions about that when, uh, when we were writing that part of the standard. And one of the perfect examples was that a manufacturer said, well, so I have, uh, I have a bunch of products. Um, they are, uh, they're about the same size. I know they're made of the same materials. They're handled by the same people. And uh, so if, even though it's not the exact same product, maybe a slightly different size, which would be one opportunity. But they said even further, so same materials, like I said, same handling. Uh, they felt that there was no need based on a risk-based approach for them to have to perform recovery efficiency testing on all those different types of products. And, and in, the, in the working group and the committee, we agreed that if you can put together a solid rationale uh, based on a, micro, a microbiological understanding of where microorganisms might be and which types, uh, then we felt it would be appropriate to apply a recovery efficiency to multiple product types. All right, thank you, Martel. We'll move on to our next question here. Uh, where can we find the current text of the ISO 11737-1 uh, document that's under review? Okay, so 
<clears throat> since we since we just got that the 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 fifteen day review of that means uh which is sent to all of the working groups uh and around in all the ISO countries. Uh that that's an opportunity for us to look at that and say it's it's no longer a vote. Uh we're no longer able to provide comments. It's just a an opportunity to say were our previous comments incorporated correctly. Um so I honestly I, I do not understand exactly if you're out if you're not a member of one of the working groups I do not know if there's a way to get a hold of that version of the document. Um, so, uh, but but what it does tell us is that it is very close to being published. So I, I would anticipate that being available and uh, by about the end of the year uh, or shortly after the new year. Now, if anyone has specific questions about parts of that, uh, you're welcome to follow up with me via an email, um, and I can help. Uh, I can help provide that. I think at some point it does become available to the general public, uh, but I am not aware of at what point that occurs. All right, thank you, Martel. Our next question says, uh, with regard to event-related uh, sterilization, does this eliminate the need for any uh, expiry date? or expiry date, excuse me. I'll take that one, Chris. Um, with regards to what Jason was specifically talking about with relationship to event-related shelf life studies, that does not remove any liability regarding either the establishment or the, um, the usage of an expiry date. That is a requirement that you have to have on your packaging. All right, thank you, Wendy. Uh, we'll move on to our next question here. Uh, are there any uh, deterministic test methods for uh, porous flexible packaging, like uh, I guess it's Tyvek pouches? Um, not, um, ugh, that's a hard question because I don't know every method off the top of my head right now. Um, the most common ones that are used for bubble are bubble emission and um, dye migration testing, and so those are not considered deterministic methods. Those are probabilistic. Um, the limiting factor with a majority of the deterministic methods are the fact that they're designed for rigid containers. Um, I do know that. Uh, the mass extraction technologies are starting to work on creating um, fixtures possibly for porous flexible barriers, but um, that's not something that we've looked into at this point right now. We are just staying focused on the rigid um, containers. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Our next question here says, uh, what are the main differences between uh, TIR-76 and ISO and TS-13004, since both documents address uh, substantiation for changing the VD max. Yeah, the, there is a lot of overlap between those two, uh, and that overlap is somewhat intentional. Uh, ST-67 has been around here in the U.S. for many years, and um, and this is the first time to have an ISO document to address assurance of sterility. So we actually hoped that they would incorporate a lot of the concepts from SD67 into the ISO standard or ISO document. Now, uh, now that the ISO document is done, it's in the process now of being published, we are not going to remove SD67 because SD67 uh, contains some additional information and some examples that we feel are valuable for uh, for companies to use in selecting an alternate SAL if needed. All right, thank you, Martel. Uh, we'll move on to our next question here. It looks like we've got quite a few in here. So uh, our next one is going to be that you mentioned uh, that sterility should be maintained until the SBS is opened or damaged. Do you mean uh, that it's required to verify product sterility after sterilization validation, and then how? Chris, this is Jason. I'll take that question. 
what, what we're talking about specifically is making sure that you design your packaging in a manner that will allow it to maintain sterility after, this, after it goes through sterilization. So um, we're not talking about doing product sterility testing after the, the sterilization validation. It, the, the emphasis is just to make sure that you're, you're engineering that packaging so that it's a good barrier and appropriate for the product. Yeah, Martel has a, a, an additional comment to that question. Along those lines, we do get the requests frequently from companies who send us product which has been fully sterilized, uh, and maybe there's been a problem with the sterilization process, or they're using it to, to complete a shelf life determination, and they say, well, just perform sterility testing for us uh, so we can say that the product is still sterile after the, after the intended shelf life. And the FDA has an excellent guidance document on that that they publish, which says clearly that the physical test methods, for example, container, container closure testing, is a much better way to assess continued sterility rather than performing a sterility test. So those of you that have worked in a laboratory or performed sterility testing know that there are too many opportunities for potential contamination, especially for a package that has been handled and stored for long periods of time where there's been a lot of, uh, there are a lot of microorganisms on the outside of that package. Uh, the, the risk is too high in doing it that way, and scientifically the better approach is to perform package testing and show that after aging that the product, or that the packaging is still, uh, still maintains integrity. And if the packaging still maintains integrity, the product will always still be sterile. All right, well, thank you, Jason and Martel. Looks like we have time for one, maybe two more. I'm going to try and sneak one more in here, and we'll see where we get after that. The next question here, uh, is it common for some PVC to turn yellow or D color after gamma sterilization? Yes, it is common. Uh, and there are other polymers that, that will show a similar reaction. There's an excellent guidance document out uh, from Amy. It's Amy TIR17 which just underwent a new revision about a year ago or so, and it contains great information actually on all sterilization modalities regarding uh, all of the main uh, families of polymers and how well they react to different types of sterilization. And then there's a little bit of guidance given, so oftentimes uh, if you look at the radiation section of that, of that document, you can find that it does say uh, that it may discolor or may embrittle. There, there's good guidance in, in uh, TIR-17. All right. Well, thank you, Martel. That looks like all the time that we have for questions for today. Just as a reminder to our audience, if we didn't get to your question today, someone will be getting back to you via email after the program is over. And I'd like to thank our speakers, Wendy, Jason, Martel, and Paul, for a great presentation and Q&A session. And let our audience know that within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demands. So please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to uh, listen to today's event. And this webinar is copyright 2017 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Nelson Laboratories. The individual speakers are solely, uh, solely responsible for their content and opinions. I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for joining us for today's course, and we hope that you'll join us tomorrow.